Hey guys, thanks for your interest in these kits or thank you for purchasing one of these kits. So let's get right into what you're gonna need to do to assemble it. Uh, you're gonna wanna start out taking all four of your heat sinks and cleaning it with some rubbing alcohol. This will get all the grease from handling and shipping and machining and it'll also get a little bit of the extra dye left over from the anodization process. So make sure not to skip this step. Next, line up all your heat sinks in the same direction with the large wire through hole facing the left. And with this orientation, you're gonna to wanna to start by putting the screw in the top left and bottom right as you're looking at it right now. This will ensure that the cob holder and reflector adapter line up perfectly for all your cobs. Next, you'll take the graphite thermal interface material and very carefully peel back one of the little squares. I like to put the self-adhesive sticky side right onto the cob. That way, that's where you need it and that's where it'll always stay. So um, I like to use a little paper towel here to smooth it out. You could also use a lint-free cloth of some kind um, just because my hands are not perfectly clean from this whole installation and video shooting process. Now you're gonna wanna line up the cob with the positive going straight up, uh, lining up with the ideal cob holder just to make sure that the connections and polarity are gonna line up. Then you flip it over and pay special attention to the little spring on the bottom of the ideal chip lock system. This spring will hold the chip in place uh, once you've inserted it into the cob holder. I like to just use the edges of my fingernails to push down against the spring. So it can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but um, with enough practice, you'll get it. So just line up the top corner and push it down and you'll hear a, you'll hear a little click and that'll get you about halfway there. Then just apply some pressure on the corners and that'll get it all the way into the cob holder. Next, what I usually like to do is just flip it upside down and make sure that it's gonna hold. You don't have to shake it this violently like I'm about to, but um, you, know, you can shake it. Make sure the spring is depressed as I'm showing you here and uh, give it a little shake. Uh, if it holds in, then you're good to go. You're good to put it on the heat sink. Now, the, one of the nice things about the cob holders that we're dealing with is that they have this larger dimer to hole on the outside that allows you to just slip it in place. So you slip it in place, give it a little turn and screw it down. Now with these uh, metal cob holders, even though they are metal, that doesn't mean you have to go Gorilla or He-Man on the screws. Just screw it down firmly. That's all you need to do. The last thing you wanna do is over tighten and crack the chip. Now to install the reflector adapter, um, if you follow these instructions, the holes will all line up and you can screw those in as well. Now this is a plastic part, so it doesn't need to be He-Man tight either. Just screw it in firmly and leave it at that. Now I'm installing the reflector here just to show you how easily it pops on and off, but I would probably leave them off um, until you're done. Now these, this is uh, some of the other stuff that you're gonna need for the build that's not included in the kit. It's a drill and an eighth inch drill bit, a screwdriver and some wire strippers, um, you'll need a hacksaw to cut your angled aluminum. Uh, you'll need the angled aluminum or whatever you're gonna hang these heat sinks on. And lastly, you'll need a wall plug for uh, whatever country you're in. You see I'm using a US plug, 110 volt here. Now, the wiring that you'll use for this kit um, that is not included is some 18 gauge solid core wire. Uh, you only need about 10 feet of it. And you can get it just about anywhere. Um, so you can see here, uh, these are some of the angled aluminum pieces. Now, this is three quarter by three quarter angled aluminum and it's 16 inch thick. I bought the cheap stuff for the video since I'm gonna be running through it. You can go eighth inch thick if you want something that's a little more substantial, but there's no problem going 16 inch thick. It's gonna run you about 10 bucks from any metal supply. If you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, mm, you're gonna spend a little bit more on it. Now your first step is taking your angled aluminum and measuring it to the bar length that you wanna do. Now I normally do 36 inch bars, but I'm gonna do a 42 inch bar. And my recommendation is however big your room is or your space is, if it's a three foot space, do a three foot bar. If it's a four foot space, do a four foot bar. This way you'll have a little bit extra and you can always cut it down later, but you can never add more, it's like a haircut. Um, so you need two bars, the length of your grow space, and then you're gonna need four smaller little pieces. Now. For us in America, this is four and three sixteenths inches is what I'm marking here. Um, it, this is gonna line up perfectly with the flat edges on the heat sink. Um, so the heat sink sits, sits snugly right in the L-shaped aluminum. So I'm just marking this out and uh, I'll mark four equal pieces. Now, when it comes to cutting this stuff, I understand not everybody has the same tools. So you can cut this stuff with a Dremel tool, with a hacksaw like you see I'm doing in the top left with an angle grinder. And if you have a 60 tooth or more, 60 or 80 tooth um, 
blade for your chop saw, you can just cut it right on a chop saw. It's perfectly fine and safe. If you're just doing it a couple times, you won't end up dulling your bit. Now the next step is take all your angled aluminum, the long pieces and the short pieces, and mark the corners. Um, I go about a half inch or three or three eighths of an inch from either side, and I just go ahead and drill holes uh, in all the corners of all the pieces, the long pieces, the short pieces, etc. And here you can see how easy it is with just a standard eighth inch drill bit to drill right through it. Now, when it comes to assembling this angled aluminum together, you got a lot of different options. You can see here you can use a nut and a bolt. Um, I like to use 632 bolts and nuts uh, because it works great with the eighth inch drill bit. You can also use standard screws, self-tapping, or you can use rivets. Um, Harbor, Harbor Freight has a riveter on sale right now for five bucks for the riveter with 100 rivets. Now you see here I'm just demonstra demonstrating screwing it together. And this is just with a self-tapping screw. Pretty easy method. It leaves you with some sharp tips on the other side, but you can always file or cut those tips down so you don't cut yourself or your wiring. Now, the next uh, demonstration here is just with a riveter. Um, I've only owned one of these for a few months and I absolutely love having it. Super simple. You just insert the rivet into the eighth inch hole, press and squeeze, and it crimps it together, cuts off the edge of the rivet, and it's super strong um, for what it is. Uh, the last method is probably what I imagine a lot of you guys will go with, which is just the nut and bolt method. There's nothing wrong with it. They're cheap. You can get a, for 88 cents, you can get a pack of about eight or 10 of these. Um, so two packs should be enough to do the whole job. Um, and here I am just screwing it in and I would screw it fairly tight, but leave it a little bit loose until you're all done. You can go back and tighten everything else up in case you need to make any minor tweaks. Now with this 42 inch bar that I have, I'm spacing my heat sinks out, just kind of eyeballing them for now, just to see what looks right, what feels right for the grow space. And this is going to vary. So I'm not going to give you guys any hard and fast uh, cob spacing. Um, 10 to 12 inches works really well. Um, but depending on your space, you might have them six inches apart. You might have them 18 inches apart. Now, the final step for preparing the L shaped aluminum is marking out the mounting holes for the side of the heat sink. You can see here that it's just over three quarter of an inch if you're using Imperial or exactly 20 millimeters if you're using the metric system. So what you'll do is you take your center mark on the L-shaped aluminum that you just marked, and then just mark about 3 eighths of an inch from either side. Now, if you drill the holes a little bit larger um, in the L-bracket aluminum, that'll give you a little bit of wiggle room left or right in case your measurements aren't perfect. Mine certainly weren't. So here I'm just uh, checking to see if the holes are going to line up. Looks like it's going to line up pretty well. So I'll just insert one of these heat sinks in the L channel that I've made, and I'll go ahead and insert the screws. Now there's two sets of screws that come with this kit. There's the M3, which is for screwing down the LEDs, and the M3.5, they're longer and bigger diameter. That's what we'll use here. Um, so just in case anyone confuses that, they are fairly close in size, but um, the bigger ones clearly go in the heat sink. Finally, I'm just making a little shelf for the driver itself. I'm going to choose to put the driver on board with the fixture, but you're welcome to remotely mount this. Um, you'll need to step up the gauge of the wire to 16 gauge if you're going to go 10 feet uh, or 14 gauge if you're going to go over 10 feet away from the first cob. So you can remotely mount these drivers just like you would an HPS ballast like on the wall somewhere. Um, but for the simplicity of this build, I'm just going to mount this to a little rail and stick it in the center. Now what it's going to do is affect my spacing just a little bit by about an inch, but that's okay for me because um, I'm just doing this as a demonstration and um, you know it's not super critical that the cobs be lined up perfectly. This is more just to show you guys how an assembly, a theoretical assembly would go. So I'm just using some screws here for speed just to secure the driver down. And before you add the heat sinks, I would highly recommend, especially if it's your first build, take a red marker and a black marker and mark the positive and negative sides of the cobs. This just ensures that you have a visual check. So finally, with the cobs marked out, we're ready to just screw it onto the rails. It's just as easy as grabbing a screwdriver and screwing it down. Like I said, don't go He-Man tight on it. Just get it securely in place, um, but leave it a little bit loose in case you need to make any fine adjustments. Now, for your wiring, you're gonna need two pieces of wire about 16 inches long and you're gonna need a four foot piece of wire. Now, that's the white wire that you see, and I would recommend marking it as well. Mark it red on one end and black on the other end. That way, each wire has its own individual positive and negative. That way, it's dummy proof. You can't screw it up. Now, from the driver's DC outside, 
Go ahead and strip back about four to five inches of the wire sheathing on the outside, the insulation. This will allow you to take the driver's positive and negative wires and connect it directly to the first set of cobs. So you'll connect the negative from the driver to the negative of one cob and the positive of the driver to the positive of a different cob, just like you see here. Now with those connection made, you take the short wires and bridge the gap between the cobs. If you follow these instructions closely, it's almost impossible to screw this up. You've got everything completely marked, color coded, and the rest of the installation practically does itself. But I'll continue to talk you through it um, so you guys don't get confused and you wire it up properly. So just continue following your color coding. The positive side of this first cob here on the right is gonna come out and go into the negative of the adjacent cob. And that's how it works, just daisy chaining them together in series wiring. So when I make this next connection, this will be almost the last connection. All we'll have to do is connect the two outside cobs. So we'll use the four foot piece of wire that I mentioned earlier to connect the positive from this far left cob to the negative on the far right cob, and that completes the circuit. So I've had to drill a little hole here just for neatness, uh, for cleanliness, because I'm a perfectionist. Generally, you don't wanna run any kind of wiring through bare metal. Um, because through vibration and, and movement, you could uh, puncture the wire insulation. So what I'm going to do here is add just a little bit of silicone. This is a thermal silicone, but it's the only kind I have. And um, by centering the wire in the middle of the hole and adding some silicone on the outside, if there is any movement or vibration, it will keep the wire from brushing up against the metal and potentially grounding out on the L-bracket aluminum. Now, if you want to go slightly more pro than that, um, after I make this connection, this final connection here, I like to pull it pretty tight, um, so I use some pliers to use the to make the final connection. But uh, I've sourced some grommets. I got these from Harbor Freight. It's you know five bucks for a 180 pack, and um, you can use these little grommets. You can get them also at AutoZone um, if you'd like, but you don't have to. You can use hot glue or silicone. It works just fine. But uh, if you want to add that extra little special touch, you can add uh, grommets to all your holes that you're drilling. So now we'll go ahead and connect the AC side. I'm in the United States, so we use 110 volt with these two parallel straight prongs. And you guys have probably seen this before. In fact, you probably uh, installed many of these before. Um, it's pretty simple. The ground goes to the bottom green, and then the neutral and hot wire go to one of the two top um, terminals. When Mark over at Cutter and I were first putting together this kit, we talked about including a plug end or a cord, but the fact of the matter is there's just too many different voltages in different countries that um, we couldn't possibly cover everybody. So you're gonna have to source a little plug, um, but it shouldn't be a big problem. Now, if you guys are not interested in dimming this fixture, you wanna run it flat out. The final lead is the dimming leads and you can go ahead and cut it. Now this is different, um, a little different setup than you probably are familiar with with the two wire dimming lead. Um, here I am just capping it off with tape. You don't want these things shorting out on each other or the metal, so just tape them off and tuck the wire in and cable tie it if you're not interested in dimming. If you are interested in pulse width modulation dimming, you're gonna use the gray, which is ground. Gray is always ground in this fixture, and the purple. If you're interested in potentiometer dimming, standard dimming, you're going to use the yellow and the gray. Now here's a 100K potentiometer. It dims one driver. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and attach a 10K resistor to the ground side. What the resistor does, and the resistor is not completely necessary, but what it does is it keeps the yellow wire and the gray wire from completely shorting out. Um, the idea behind a potentiometer is that it shorts out the wires a little bit, variably, right? That's how it dims. Um, but you don't want them shorting out completely and grounding out. And um, depending on the quality of the potentiometer, when you turn it all the way low, um, they can do that. So by adding a little 10K resistor in here, you protect yourself. This means that when you turn the dimmer knob all the way down, all the way to its lowest setting, you still have 10K ohms worth of resistance, which means the driver will still run at 10%, which is what it's capable of uh, when you're analog dimming. So um, resistors are a nickel or seven cents, so go ahead and add one if you can. Finally, just gonna hang it up. You could probably wrap one of those ratcheting rope chains around it, but uh, I'm just grabbing a little bit of this wire that I had laying around, and I'm gonna crimp it together to make a little hoop so that um, when I go ahead and hang my rope ratchet um, hangers on it, it'll uh, just sit around those little ropes. 
So uh, finally, I don't know why I did this. I just took the weight just because I thought it was pretty light. Turns out it's 8.7 pounds, which is pretty light if you're in a crappy Chinese grow tent or you know some situation like that. Uh, finally plugging it in on the AC side, we got 219, which will drop down to about 217 watts uh, once it's heated up a little bit at 1.79 amps. So uh, pretty low amp draw, but a uh, little more than what you thought you're getting. With the 200 watts, it's actually 217. So that's great. Um, so here it is finished. Um, you know, very simple little bar. Um, hard to estimate how long it actually took me because I was filming and, and editing and doing other stuff. But uh, you should be able to put it together pretty quick. This L bracket aluminum is very easy to work with and it's very inexpensive. So I hope you enjoyed this first video and I'll have more configuration videos for your grow space coming out on my channel. So please be sure to like, subscribe and comment. Let me know what you want from me in the kit.